Hi everybody, thanks for tuning back into a little bit more of Crenshaw. We're getting near the end. Okay, chapter 47, page 223 is where we begin. I couldn't fall asleep that night. Sounds echoed off the walls of our empty apartment. Shadows loomed and shrank. A question kept nagging me. Why did things have to be this way? Life isn't always fair, Crenshaw had said. His words reminded me of an interesting nature fact Miss Malone had taught us last year in fourth grade. Bats, she said, actually share food with each other. She was talking about vampire bats, the ones that slice open sleeping mammals in the dark of night. They don't actually suck blood. It's more like they lap it up, which is awesome enough. But the really amazing part the no way part is that they get back to their caves, is that when they get back to their caves, they share with the unlucky bats who haven't found anything to eat. They actually puke up warm blood into the hungry bats' mouths. If that's not the coolest nature fact ever, I don't know what is. Miss Malone said maybe, maybe bats were altruists, which means that they're sharing to help the other bats even if it's a risk. She said some scientists say yes, some say no. Scientists love to disagree about things. Miss Malone looked at me then because even though it was only like the third week of school, she already had me pegged pretty well. Jackson, she said, maybe you'll be the one to settle that great are bats nice guys debate. I said probably not because I wanted to be a cheetah or manatee or dog scientist, but I would keep bats in mind as a backup plan. Miss Malone said something else about bats that day. She said she sometimes wondered if maybe bats are better human beings than human beings are. Chapter 48. I must have finally fallen asleep because I awoke from a, from a horrible nightmare. I was panting, tears streamed down my cheeks. The moon was wrapped in fog. Crenshaw sat, Crenshaw placed a paw on my shoulder. Gently, he butted his head against mine. Bad dream, he asked. I don't remember it, really. I was in a cave, I think, and I was yelling for someone to help me and nobody would listen. I'll help, said Crenshaw, I'll listen. I turned to him looking in his eyes and I could see myself reflected. I can't go with my family, I said. My own words surprised me. I can't live in the minivan again. I don't want to have to worry anymore. I am tired, Crenshaw. I know, he said, I know. I blinked. The answer was obvious. I had to run away. It wasn't going to be much of a trip. I would just have to ask Marisol if I could stay with her. She had plenty of room. I could help around the house. I leaped up. Crenshaw watched me, but he didn't say a word. It wasn't like I had a lot to pack. I grabbed my pillow, my keepsake bag, some clothes, and my toothbrush. The way I figured it, I'd go over to Marisol's house before my family woke up. Marisol was an early riser. She wouldn't mind. It was, it was hard to find a piece of paper and a pencil, but I managed. Aretha and Crenshaw watched me chew on the pencil as I tried to decide what to write. What should I say? I, I asked, as much to myself as to Crenshaw. Tell the truth to the, per to the person who matters most, said Crenshaw. You. And so I did. Dear Mom and Dad, here are the facts. I'm tired of not knowing what is going to happen. I am old enough to understand things. I hate living this way. I'm going to live with Marisol for a while. When you figure things out, maybe I can join you. Love, Jackson. P.S. Aretha likes to sleep on a pillow, so don't forget. And P.P.S. Robin needs to know what's happening, too. In an envelope, I put $10 I'd made from rock walking the Groucher's dash hounds. On the outside, I wrote, to cover two unfortunate incidents where I used very bad judgment, Please give $7 to Safeway for two jars of Gerber chicken and rice and $3 to Pet Food Express for a cookie shaped like a cat. Tap, 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 tap. 
It was Robin knocking on my door. Jax, I dropped my pencil. Go to sleep, Robin, it's late. It's scary in my room. Well, it'll be morning soon, I said. I'll just wait here by your door, Robin said. I have spot to, I have spot to keep me company. I looked at Crenshaw. He held up his paws. Don't ask me, human children are infinitely more complicated than kittens. Please go back to bed, Robin, I pleaded. I don't mind waiting, she said. I stood. I went to the door. I hesitated. I opened it. Robin came in. She had Spot, her pillow, and her Lyle book. I looked at her. I looked at my note. I crumpled it up and tossed it aside. We read Lyle together until we both fell asleep. Chapter 50. When I awoke, Robin, Aretha, and Crenshaw were spread out on my mattress. Robin and Aretha were both drooling a little. Sitting on the floor across from us were my mom and dad. They had on their bathrobes. My dad had my crumpled note flattened out in his lap. Good morning, my mom whispered. I didn't answer her. Didn't even look at her. Fact, my dad said softly. Parents make mistakes. A lot, my mom added. Fact, said my dad. Parents try not to burden their kids with grown-up problems, but sometimes that's hard to do. Robin stirred, but she didn't wake. Well, it's hard being a kid, too, I said. I was glad I sounded angry. It's hard not to know what's happening. I know, said my dad. I don't want to go back to that time, I said, my voice getting louder with each word. I hated you for putting us through it. It wasn't fair. Other kids don't have to sleep in their car. Other kids aren't hungry. I knew that wasn't true. I knew that lots of other kids had it worse than I did, but I didn't care. Why can't you just be like other parents? I demanded. I was crying hard. I gasped for breath. Why does it have to be this way? My mom came over and tried to hug me. I wouldn't let her. We're so sorry, sweetheart, she whispered. My dad stiff. My dad sniffed. He cleared his throat. I looked over at Crenshaw. He was awake, watching me carefully. I took a deep, shuddery breath. I know you're sorry, but that doesn't change the way things are. You're right, said my dad. No one talked for a few minutes. The only sound was Crenshaw purring gently, and only I could hear him. Slowly, very slowly, I began to feel my anger changing into something softer. It's okay, I finally said. It's really okay. I just want to tell, I just want you to tell me the truth from now on. That's all. Well, that's fair, my dad said. More than fair, my mom agreed. I'm getting older, I said. I can handle it. Well, then here's another fact, said my dad. Last night, I called the guy who wanted to buy our guitars. He told me his brother owns that music store down by the mall. He needs an assistant manager. His brother also has a garage apartment behind the store that won't be occupied for a month. It'll give us a roof over our heads for a little while anyway, and maybe some more work. Well, that's good, right? I asked. It's good, my dad said, but it's not a certainty. Here's the thing, Jackson. Life is messy. It's complicated. It would be nice if life was always like this. He drew an imaginary line that kept going up and up. But life is actually a lot more like this. He made a jiggly line that went up and down like a mountain range. You just have to keep trying. What's the expression, my mom asked? Fall down seven times, get up eight? Make fortune cookie wisdom, said my dad. Oh, more fortune cookie wisdom, said my dad, but it's true. My mom patted my back. Starting today, we'll be honest with you, we'll be as honest with you as we can. Is that what you want? I looked over at Crenshaw and not, he nodded. Yes, I said, that's what I want. All right then, said my dad, it's a deal. Fact, said my mom, I'd really like some breakfast. Let's go see what we can do about that. All right, tune in next time and we'll pick up on chapter 51. Don't forget to like and subscribe.